We've all heard about something called the innovator's dilemma, but we on TechCrunch have never had the opportunity to talk to the author, the inventor of the idea of the innovator's dilemma. Professor Clay Christensen, who is uh, a professor at the Harvard Business School, uh, invented the term innovator's dilemma, and we've caught him to talk more about this dilemma on TechCrunch TV. Clay, welcome to TechCrunch TV. Delighted to be with you. Thanks for thinking of me. Well, I'm sure you get this question a hundred times a day, Clay, but for our audience, for the 1% of the people in the audience who don't know what the innovator's dilemma is, tell me what it is and how you invented it. Well, the puzzle that I was trying to understand is if you look across the sweep of business history, most companies which are just widely regarded as unassailable, a decade or two later you find them in the middle of the pack or the bottom of the heap. And always it had been attributed to, well, the management team just kind of found, found themselves out of the league. But, man, I know a lot of CEOs of companies that went through that process and they are very smart. And so the puzzle was, geez, how is it that even the smartest people find success so hard to sustain? And I reached the strangest conclusion, and that was that there truly is an innovator's dilemma. Doing the right thing will kill you. So I, I never anticipated that that would be the result. Give me some examples, particularly in the technology community, uh, using IBM or Microsoft or perhaps even Google as models for your theory. Boy, they're, they're, they abound. Can I start with Cisco? Absolutely. Okay. So before Cisco, there was a technology called circuit switching, and the leaders in making that equipment were Lucent, Nortel, Alcatel. And uh, boy, these machines were just powerful, very fast, very high reliability. And Cisco came up with this product called a router. And the router packetized what you were going to send and then just spanned it out over the internet. And it took about four seconds to collect itself and reorient itself at the other end. And uh, so you really couldn't use packet switching for voice. So, but at the bottom of the of this um, market, data, holy cow, routing was so much faster than first class mail, you know, that, that um, Cisco started down at an undemanding application for this new technology. And Lucent would ask, listen to their customers and ask the customers, could we use a root router technology for you? And for them, it made no sense because it was cheaper, um, not as profitable to Lucent. And so Lucent just kept listening to their customers, making faster and faster and ever more reliable equipment. And the router just got getting better and better. And all of a sudden, the router was fast enough that it could do voice. And Lucent looked at that, and it made no sense at all to, to, to go after lower quality products and then the customers just were evacuated from one to the other and now underneath Cisco you see uh, blade servers and uh, sw uh, soft switches and Huawei coming up below them and so they used advantage of the in innovators dilemma to kill Nortel and Lucent and now these guys are trying to use the same tools to go after Cisco. That's why Toyota came in at the bottom of the market with little rusty little subcompacts. And General Motors and Ford were, make, were making big cars for big people. And when General Motors would look down at Toyota, it made no sense to go after the subcompact market when the, the profits that they could get on bigger SUVs and bigger pickup trucks made all the sense in the world. But Toyota just made their products better and better and better and better until one by one customers that had to use cost or buy bigger General Motors cars now they could buy a cheaper one here and now Toyota's making the best in the world you look at the bottom here is Kia and Hyundai the Koreans 
and they've stolen the low end of the market. And it's not because Toyota's asleep at the switch. That is, they have to decide, should we go down and compete against Kia, or should we go up and compete against Mercedes? It makes no sense. Can some companies escape the innovator's dilemma? I'm thinking, of course, of, of Apple. I'm sure everybody asks you this yeah. question. I worry about Apple, but there are some examples. So, for example, uh, disruption has happened over and over again in the computer business. So there were about nine companies that made mainframes. The mini computer disrupted the mainframe. Only one of the mainframe computers, IBM, made it into the mini computer business. The other eight were killed. The way IBM did it was they made the mainframes in Poughkeepsie, went to Rochester, Minnesota to make the minis. And that was a different business model. Gross margins of 60 cent, 60 percent in mainframes, 25 or 45 percent in the minis. And there were about eight companies that made mini computers. When the, the personal computer disrupted the mini computer, all of the other ones got killed except IBM. And IBM went to Florida and set up yet again a different business model that could make money at 25 percent margins. So under the corporate umbrella, one generated gross margins of 60 percent, one 45 percent, one 25 percent. And it's kind of, and everybody else got killed. And it, you kind of get this sense that, like in, in um, biological evolution, individual organisms don't evolve. They're born, they die. But the, the population evolves as the mutants gain more market share. And you get the same sense in corporate evolution. Business units aren't designed to evolve. They have a business model. They make money in a particular way, serve a particular group of people. But a corporation can evolve if it sets up and shuts down business units. And so that's how IBM evolved into now a very successful servicing company. None of the individual entities evolved. They were just did what they were to do, and when that game was over, they, were shut, they shut them down. And that's the only thing that historically has worked. So what would you teach Google now, who are trying to reinvent themselves? Well, my sense is that they have one beautiful business unit, and they know how to make money, and they know how to sell what they're doing. That business unit cannot be expected to launch new business units or new business uh, growth ideas. They need to have the ability to have multiple types of business units all around the company. And I think what I worry about is that they focus on, they think that innovation is the great idea. And in fact, their team comes up with extraordinary new great ideas. But the other part of, biz, uh, of innovation is there needs to be a new business unit that has the flexibility to generate profit in the appropriate way and stick this new idea in a business unit and let it go to the market and find its way. And what I worry is that it's the business unit innovation that they haven't been able to do. Clay, I know you're, you're doing more and more work and writing in the area of innovation, of education and healthcare. Yeah. What are you discovering there? What are the, the, the essential challenges and opportunities for innovators both in the educational and health sphere, healthcare uh, spheres? Great question. I guess in a nutshell, disruption is critical in both. In, in healthcare, do we think that it, is it plausible ever that healthcare will become affordable and accessible? by expecting the expense, the existing providers to become cheap. It just won't happen. And so what we need to do is bring technology to outpatient clinics so that you can do there the simplest of the things that have to be done in a hospital. 
and then keep driving technology into that venue so that you could go provide more and more sophisticated things and technology to doctors offices so they can do there the simplest of the things that previously had had to be done in a clinic or a hospital bring technology to nurse practitioners so that they can do more and more of the things that previously required a doctor to do and so each of these is disruptive but we need to bring technology that enables lower cost venues of care and lower cost caregivers to do more sophisticated things to go up market and that's the way healthcare becomes affordable and accessible not by expecting the expensive ones to become cheap and education education so much is determined by the success in uh, supplanting traditional teaching with online learning. And it doesn't mean that, doc that, ten that uh, teachers are going to be made redundant, but online learning allows the teachers to take a very different role rather than standing in front of people and just delivering content in a monolithic way. The delivery comes online and the, doct the, the teacher becomes a tutor. And uh, you can see when done properly in K through 12 a big difference. But I think the biggest impact of online learning will be amongst the universities. Clay, final question. Uh, you as a business professor of course treat disruption always as a good thing. Do you worry about it at all, particularly in the way in which the cycles seem to be increasing and more and more people seem incapable of reinventing themselves and catching up with the economy? I worry a lot. I, I worry the most that the business professors and those who write business books really um, confuse people and cause good people who could be very successful not to catch these things. Because you look at the typical business book or article, it's a snapshot. At a given point of time, these guys are doing better than those and therefore all of you idiots ought to emulate what the successful ones are doing and five years later the whole thing has changed and a snapshot doesn't tell you how things happened the way they did and what's going to happen in the future. You need to have models. You need to have in a sense movies that allow you to predict over time what you have to do in order to be successful. So if you have a, a movie, if a snapshot you'd say Apple is just unassailably, unassailably successful. Actually, in the future, there are some very big challenges that they're going to confront. Not because somebody took a snapshot of the future, but if you look at what causes success to happen, the causal mechanism, there's a lot in their future. And there's a lot in the future relating to Outsourcing the wrong thing means that you essentially liqu liqu li li liquidate your business model. I had a stroke and sometimes I can't remember the right words, but a lot of people are, are killing their own companies because they don't have a sense of the dynamics of their industry. They just see the stat static view. Well, Clay Christensen, the inventor of the innovator's dilemma, uh, on that fascinating note about the unpredictability of the future, thank you so much for appearing on TechCrunch TV. Delighted to be with you. Thanks so much.